topic is what's going on right now in the Middle East with this war between uh, first an attack of Hamas, so to speak, against Israel, which was really an attack by Iran against Israel. I'll talk about that. And then um, Israel responding uh, in part, number one, by trying to wipe out Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And number two, uh, it sent a missile that um, killed the uh, some of the Iranian military leaders who were meeting with the Hamas military leaders in Damascus uh, next to the Iranian embassy, as I recall. And so there there had been this this like war cabinet meeting of Iran and Hamas planning the war with a bunch of the you know hedge honchos, and Israel blew up the building and uh, killed the participants in that war council, um, which anyway, seems to me to be a perfectly legitimate military target. But anyway, Iran retaliated with over 300 uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and uh, drones attacking Israel with hundreds of tons of explosive warheads and bombs, almost none of which did any damage in Israel. I think 1% got through and um, there was only one injury in all of Israel and there was very little uh, damage to any even buildings or military bases, although there was one military airfield that was slightly damaged, but back in operation a half a day later. Question, is that a miracle? Yes, and I'll talk about that. Uh, okay, here is an account by an Israeli scientist who uh, works now works for the security system in Israel and has a is a doctor of physics has a doctorate in physics and here's what he wrote this is a letter he wrote to his rabbi he wanted to share with his rabbi something that is more than a feeling that on Shabbat night that is the Saturday night when the attack took place something happened here on the scale of the splitting of the Red Sea. I am a doctor of physics and I worked for several years in the defense industry in Israel in projects that are still the cutting edge of the technology of the State of Israel. When I look at what happened on Saturday night on a scientific level, it simply cannot happen. Everyone, and I mean everyone, acted as one man in perfect unity. The likelihood that everything works out just as it should does not exist in complex systems like the defense systems that were operating. They have never, I mean never, even beyond the state of Israel, ever been tried in real time. I took a pencil and dove into the calculations to check the likelihood that such a result would materialize. The large number of events that had to be handled at precisely the right time doubles the chance of making a mistake. With all the high technologies, the expectation was for a breach in the defense of the skies of the state of Israel. Even if we got 90% protection, it would be a miracle. What happened, though, is that everyone, and I mean everyone, the pilots, the system operators, the technology operators, act as one man at one moment in total unity. If this is not an act of God, then I no longer know what a miracle is. This is sharper than the victory of the Six-Day War or the War of Independence. Those can be explained according to nature. The rescue that took place for the people of Israel on that Shabbat night is simply impossible naturally. I believe that this miracle saved the lives of many people in Israel. If the defense system had failed to intercept a number of cruise missiles, the result would have dragged us into a very complex campaign. I wouldn't bet that next time it will work like this without divine supervision. The simple proof of what I said is that the managers of the security industries who develop and manufacture these systems guarantee no more than 90% success. And then he ends with a quote. 
Since the day you came out of the land of Egypt, we have shown you wonderful things. Happy Passover. It, it was a miracle. Okay, this is, this is from another Israeli. Yesterday, when I sat in front of the screen and saw the interceptions, tears came rolling down my face. From talking to some acquaintances, it seems that the public does not understand the historical magnitude of the event, apparently because we have grown into reality with an iron dome, but this is a completely different event. The uh, missile defense system in Israel is, uh, has the name Iron Dome. Unlike Iron Dome, which has had since 2011 thousands of operational opportunities to learn and improve, the first time Arrow 2 and 3 faced a real operational challenge was in the current war. In other words, the more advanced elements in this defense system are um, Arrow 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is about the interception of one single missile by each of them. That's it. To try to illustrate the meaning of things, imagine a person who practices basketball for 30 years alone, right? Just alone on a court all by himself. And the first time he steps on the court is for a one-on-one -on -one game against Michael Jordan and he wins 100 to zero. This is the event. And on a personal note, I got a message from one of the Harpa Day singers who was in Jerusalem on that Saturday night and she looked out the window and she said it looked like Star Wars. It just was a continuous, continuous display of explosions in the sky, enemy missiles being intercepted by Israeli defense missiles. This is simply a map of the attack and uh, there of course you see Israel. Oh. To there, of course, is Israel. There's Gaza on the southern uh, coast of Israel. And there you have the countries from which the attack came. Primarily, of course, the missiles came from Iran. Uh, there were a smaller number of missiles that came up from Yemen. So there, there we have a map of the region with the actually the sons of Noah. Okay, so this is this is the world known to the Hebrews at the time of the first few generations after Noah. Those are the tribes of the sons of Noah, a, a couple of generations after the flood. The red the red ones are the sons of Japheth, and then the ones with the yellow highlighter over them are the sons of Ham. Now I will read Ezekiel 38. As we get to the various tribes that are going to wage war against Israel before its miraculous victory followed by recognizing Christ, I will read Ezekiel 38. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief priest of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great company, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Togarmah from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. So these are the tribes that are going to launch war against Israel. The first ones you heard were Gog, Meshach, and Tubal. Now those are sons of Japheth which is one of the three sons of Noah who were saved in the ark. In those days, there were no countries, right? There were only tribes, clans. And these clans, of course, these tribes occupied particular territories. So with that, we can see on this map, here is a kind of a version of the same map. But uh, the you know I think the print may be a little easier to read. Okay, so the countries we just heard, or or really the tribes we heard, the names of who are going to come across come against Israel in the Ezekiel thirty eight war, 
are Gog, Meshach, and Tubal, um, the three sons of Japheth. And those territories are Meshach is eastern Turkey, so that would be here. And um, Tubal is western Turkey, so that would be here. And Gog is essentially southern Russia, Georgia and uh, Azerbaijan, which um, are essentially here. And of course, that, so the, the countries which will come across, uh, come against Israel, are essentially Turkey, Iran, and northern, and uh, southern Russia, rather. Uh, because what it says here is Gog, the chief pre prince of Mesach and Tubal, Meshach and Tubal. So that, that would be between Gog, Meshach and Tubal, southern Russia and T Turkey. And then it mentions Persia, Cush and Put. Persia is of the descent of Japheth. Cush and Put are descended from Ham, which is another one of Noah's sons. And they correspond essentially to Libya. And Cush is a little bit more confused because uh, his tribe, that tribe was originally in the south of Egypt, but some of them then moved north of. So Cush is Iraq, Saudi Arabia, a little bit unclear. And then it goes on to say Gomer and all his hordes and Beth to Garma from the uttermost parts of the north. Beth Togarma is a son of Gomer, and that would be, uh, uh, there you see Gomer there. There you see Tubal. Actually, this is not so bad. You see Tubal, you see Gomer. There you see Magog. Magog means land of Gog. That's southern Russia, and that, that is um, one of the countries that comes against them. So basically, you have this prophecy that names the countries that are do seem to be waging war against um, Israel. And it was a little bit odd to me when I read this many years ago because I didn't see why Russia would launch war on Israel. However, um, Russia has clearly aligned itself with Iran in this war and is arming them and is um, supporting them in on the World Forum. And I have some quotes there, here about that. Okay, first of all, the Iranian uh, Air Force is um, basically getting arms from uh, from Russia. By the way, Iran was just found, lest anyone should think that the attack of Hamas was not an attack by Iran. Uh, this is from the New York Times, I believe, today. Um, letters were found that shows Iran uh, 200 million British pound payments. What's that about? A quarter of a billion dollars to Hamas. Uh, with the receipts, as they say, literally with the receipts. And on the right there is a photograph of, that it turns out to be a type letter that details the payments, the dates and the payments of 200 million British pounds from Iran to Hamas, naming the recipient, and the recipient was in fact uh, Yahweh Sinwar, the head of Hamas in Gaza. So the Gazan war, I think we all knew this, but the Gazan war now has documented proof that it was an Iranian operation. However, I should go back to Ezekiel 38. So, continuing with Ezekiel 38, Be ready and keep ready, you and all the hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land where people were gathered from many nations upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the nations and now dwell securely, all of them. So, now, here God is speaking to the bad guys, right? He's speaking to Gog of the land of Magog and all the tribes that are going to launch war against Israel. That's who the Lord is addressing here. And he says, the Lord says to the bad guys, 
Be ready and keep ready, you and all the hosts that are assembled about you. After many days you will be mustered, and you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land where people were gathered from many nations upon the mountains of Israel, that's the Jews having returned to Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the nations and now dwell securely, all of them. Israel was a wasteland from the departure of the Crusaders until until the 20th century. It was a wasteland, and we know that. We have an account, we have an account of many travelers, including Mark Twain, and I'll just read a little bit of what Mark Twain wrote in a travelogue when he traveled through the Holy Land. Riding on horseback through the Jezreel Valley, Twain observed, and now this is a quote, there is not a solitary village throughout the whole extent, not for 30 miles in either direction. There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. One may ride 10 miles and not see 10 human beings. Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. It is truly monotonous and uninviting, and there is no sufficient reason for describing it otherwise. The hills are barren, the valleys are unsightly deserts, um, it is a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land, and on and on and on. So it literally, again, this is, this is exactly as it was described in Ezekiel 38, when the Lord says, The land where people were gathered from many nations upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, its people were brought out from the nations and now dwell securely, all of them. They did dwell securely, right? Certainly a lot more securely until, until October 7th. And then, uh, continuing with Ezekiel 38, you will advance, speaking to the northern, speaking to the bad guys coming from the north, you will advance coming on like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. It's going to be a major invasion. Thus says the Lord God, on that day thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme and say I will go up against the land of unwalled villages and will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates. Remember October 7th? Everyone in southern Israel was dwelling securely with no bars or gates and thinking that they were living in peace with their neighbors in Gaza. Anyway, to seize spoil and carry off plunder to assail the waste places which are now inhabited, and the people who are gathered from the nations who have gotten cattle and goods who dwell in the, at the center of the earth. Okay, exactly what happened. Um, the merchants will say to you, have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods to seize great spoil? As they did, although most of that spoil was human. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, you will bestir yourself and come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days I will bring you against my land, and the nations, that the nations may know me when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Okay, some things about this. Okay, first of all, you will come like a cloud covering the land. Well, could that refer to the missiles and drones and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles coming like a cloud covering the land? They didn't have a word for it drones and ballistic missiles, you know, in the days of the Old Testament. Anyway, so God is going to arrange for this to happen in order that God himself can vindicate my holiness before their eyes. In other words, miraculously intervene. Continuing, I'm now on verse 17 of Ezekiel 38. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. But on that day, when Gog shall come across against the land of Israel, okay, when Russia shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, my wrath will be roused. Now, 
given that the armaments and the technology and the planes that Iran are using is using are coming from Russia and and this is you know this is being coordinated and supported by Russia i think you could argue that even the attack last saturday night was um gog coming across against israel anyway my wrath will be roused for my jealousy and in my blazing wrath i declare on that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of israel the fish of the sea the birds of the air the beasts of the sea sea of the field and all creeping things and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall quake at my presence the mountains shall be thrown down the cliffs shall fall and every wall shall tumble to the ground I will summon every kind of terror against Gog, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and bloodshed I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples that are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and brimstone. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord." Could this be a picture of an extreme, uh, basically, of Israel extremely victoriously attacking Iran and Russia? Um, as as the prophecy says, I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples that are with him torrential rains and hailstones, fire and brimstone. So that sounds like nasty things falling from the sky. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. It sounds like the missiles aren't going to hit their target, right? He'll knock the bow out of his their left hand and uh, bring, uh, what's the other line? And cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. Sounds like a picture of what happened Saturday night, right? You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, said the Lord God. Now, of the 1% of those missiles that made it through the anti-missile defense systems, um, all basically all of them, except for maybe three or four or five, fell on open fields, fell nowhere, fell in the middle of wilderness and didn't do any damage. In that entire attack, there was one injury, a seven-year-old girl, Bedouin, who was in a Bedouin village, and some uh, a fragment from a missile which was blown up in the sky by the anti-missile system fell on her family's house, and she was injured. She wasn't killed. That was it. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God, and I will send fire on Magog and on all those who live in security in the coastlands, then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. What's that sound like? That sounds like this is going to be a come to Jesus moment for Israel, right? Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. Could that be the holy name of Jesus known in the midst of his people, Israel? And I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. They do profane his holy name, right? They do not say nice things about Jesus. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. I will make myself known in the midst of my people. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done. This is the day of which I have spoken. I'm going to skip now to verse 21 because I'm getting very hoarse. I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. 
Now, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Because the house of Israel knows <laughs> that the Lord of the Old Testament is their God, right? They never doubted that. So what's it mean when he says, so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Sounds like they're going to know something new, right? Like that is actually Jesus talking. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they were unfaithful to me, and therefore I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword. That sounds like um, the Jews not accepting Jesus, right? And uh, being unfaithful to Jesus, and therefore Jesus hid his face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies, like the last 2,000 years of persecution. Um, according, to their, uh, according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Okay, again, sounds like uh, Jesus not, not giving them the grace, let's say, of conversion. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name after they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid, right? Like Israel today. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' land, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any more. Right? Again, it sounds like he's hiding their face, his face from them until now. For I, have, I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. Poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, giving them the Holy Spirit, giving them the grace to recognize Jesus, says the Lord God. And that's then the end of uh, Ezekiel 39. So, pretty exciting. I'll just go back to this map, which was the one that was um, on the show card. And uh, it's kind of a, a schematic that shows the uh, the tribes that will come against Israel that are named in Ezekiel 38 and 39. I see that somebody commented on, on Russia's alliance with Iran fighting against Israel. Oh, here. Uh, Putin Putin t uh, communicated with Iranian President Rezi, quote, Iran's response was, quote, the best way to punish the aggressor and an expression of the tact and rationality of Iran's leaders. Israel was the aggressor, right? Because you had that attack from Gaza Strip, which was clearly from Iran after, you know, $250 million were given to Hamas by Iran. And yet Israel was the aggressor that needed to be punished because they had bombed a, uh, a war cabinet meeting of between Iran and, and Hamas. And it was therefore that those 300 missiles and, and drones sent to Israel with uh, my calculation would be about 200 tons of explosive warheads was the best way to punish the aggressor and an expression of the tact and rationality of Iran's leaders. Gloria laus et honor tibisit Rex Christe Redentor Cui Promsito sana pium Israel es tu rex David es et inclita prones Nomine cui in domini Rex mele Sin 